Hi, and welcome to Ones and Twos, FP's economics podcast. Every week we take a couple of data points, we use them to try to explain the world. I'm Cameron Abadi, FP's deputy editor, with you in Berlin, Germany. As always, Adam Twos, FP's economics columnist and Columbia University professor, is with us this time also in Berlin, although we are not in the same room. Hi, Adam. Hi, Cam. So, in the second half of the show, we're going to be talking about the economics of drones. So stick around for that. But our first data point is $5.2 trillion. That is the amount by which the U.S. economy is now bigger than the economy of the European Union. $25 trillion versus $19.8 trillion is the comparison there. Europe has had stagnant economic growth for more than a decade now, and that's while the rest of the world has been doing pretty well as a whole. As uh, Financial Times columnist Gideon Rockman points out in a column this past week, that's a reversal from just 15 years earlier when Europe's economy was $1.5 trillion larger. But ever since, the EU has lost ground, with the US taking the number one spot in the early 90s. And it's a trend that's growing. The U.S. economy in most ways seems to be in solid shape right now with unemployment at record lows and the fight against inflation mostly seeming to be on track. Meanwhile, the mood in Europe mostly seems to be grim with the continent's economic engine, Germany, now seemingly in recession and inflation still high after a winter of angst over energy supplies. And that mood tracks with the sentiments one tends to hear from European policymakers about the transatlantic relationship these days, with which tends to swing from angst that the U.S. isn't committed enough to the fight in Ukraine to anger on its lack of coordination on economic issues ranging from China to climate. So we thought we'd look at the economic fundamentals of the EU-U.S. relationship and ask whether the partners are starting to diverge from one another. So yeah, Adam, obviously Europe is no stranger to crises. Periodic crises are just a part of the history of the EU. And in fact, history has shown that they can even be an engine of progress for the continent. But is what's going on here not a crisis at all, but just a sinking into chronic stagnation? This piece by Gideon Rackman sort of raised a lot of waves. And I can't believe I'm going to do this, but I'm going to disagree with him and the um, implied narrative here about US-European balance. I mean, it's not it's not that I don't have a lot of concerns about Europe. In, indeed, I'm I think quite widely regarded as a critic of European economic policy. But I think this comparison um, is is kind of misleading. Um, It it starts with the GDP numbers themselves, because these are GDP numbers based on current exchange rates. And um, exchange rates fluctuate. They fluctuate a great deal. They're one of the more fluctuating variables in the macroeconomic dashboard. And so using those as a basis for this kind of comparison, especially over a considerable period of time, is extraordinarily um, unreliable. It's just really hard to read what this particular move implies. If you pick a other starting point for this comparison, you, you can make it look as though Europe grew faster um, than the United States. It's a matter of picking your base year and then, you know, getting lucky with the exchange rates. If you take something more um, stable like purchasing power parity, which tries to remove the effect of fluctuating exchange rates and concentrates on underlying purchasing power. The US does come out ahead right now, um, but by a much smaller margin, by something more like 8%. And if you think about some of the natural advantages of the US, for instance, the fact that it's the largest fossil fuel producer in the world, um, that's perhaps not all that surprising. And now this isn't to deny that Europe's growth performance um, has been disappointing in the last 15 years. I mean, after the and in the course of the Eurozone crisis from 2010 onwards, they, they they committed what can only be described, I think, as policy crimes. But they sort of stopped doing policy crimes from round about 2012 onwards, though some people regard the austerity push from 2012 onwards as part of that. I would argue it started earlier. In any case, if you look out beyond the Eurozone crisis, policy has normalised. So the you know, this story based on sort of um, rapidly fluctuating currency, uh, 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 foreign exchange rate adjusted GDP is a really fragile basis on the basis of which to make these kind of grand comparisons. Well, what if we were to take um, military issues as a lens through which to consider the relationship? Obviously, uh, Europe is in the middle of a war and it does seem that Washington clearly has primacy on 
military strategy. Its superiority over Europe has seems to have rarely been on clearer display than in the response to the war in Ukraine. But is there a clear way that America's military dominance becomes linked to a sense of economic dominance? Does Washington use Europe's military dependence as leverage on economic issues? Yeah, I think when it comes to clout, if you like, great power, power, um, this story holds up much better than it does if you try and make it work through economic numbers, let alone if you try and do it through well-being, what actually, you know, you might think matters to the vast majority of people. And with regard to military spending, there's a, there's a sort of double fact, a double effect at work here. A, America as a share of GDP, GDP has consistently spent more than anyone in Europe for a long time. And on the other hand, Europe, for the spending that it does do, and it's a lot, it's up around 300 billion euros now, gets precious little. So America's spending is larger in both in absolute and relative terms, and Europe's spending is, one has to say, historically inefficient. Rarely have any, has any society of any societies in the world spent as much as the Europeans do on defense. 300 billion should put the, the Europeans on a par with China and way ahead of Russia. Uh, and instead, they end up reliant on the Americans for defense against an enemy like Russia. This is a this is a historic anomaly on both sides. America's is high and Europe's hugely inefficient. And that does indeed tilt the balance significantly in America's favor on key issues. I mean, the most significant is probably the way the Americans strong armed the Dutch into requiring that their world beating, you know, uh, chip manufacturing equipment supplier, ASML, the company that does these extraordinary lithograph machines with which the Taiwanese then make the chips, which NVIDIA designs for them, right, that entire supply chain, the key link in that the Americans needed to muscle was was the Dutch, and they did. And I don't think there's any doubt that geopolitical heft the desire of the Dutch to be on the right side of their American partner was a key play, was a key part of that. It's also true when you get into the defense budgets, when the Europeans come to spending these 300 billion euros that they, they, they spend, they are under huge pressure from the United States to spend the money on American equipment, in part because the Americans prefer the Europeans to be tied to them as allies by means of supply chains, but also because the Americans just want European help in defraying the upfront costs of their big weapons program. So enrolling people in the F-35 program helps to defray some of the costs to the US. And I think there's no doubt that there was celebration in Washington when in February um, 2022, Olaf Scholz, the German Chancellor, declared the Zeitenwender, the turning point in Germany's history, and declared there was going to be 100 billion euros for a defence fund, of which not very much has been spent. But the one bit that has been allocated is to buying F-35s. A, because they're available. B, because they're American and the Germans wanted to be on the right side of the Biden administration. And C, because the F-35 is nuclear capable and whose atomic bombs is it that the Germans want to be able to fly? Well, it's American atomic bombs stationed in Germany. So in all of those ways, you can see that indeed, it come, you know, when it comes to billions of tens of billions of defense spending, um, American muscle really does help and does sway and does direct European projects, even at the expense of Europe's own fighter aircraft projects. So there's a Franco-German project called the Future Combat Air System, and the French were really miffed when the Germans announced that they were signing up for the F-35. They're not really, strictly speaking, competitors because the F-35 is sort of here and the future combat air system really isn't. But nevertheless, it's a sign of the priorities that Berlin sets. I wonder if there's a more fundamental issue at work here, namely technology, because, you know, this runs from everything from the major digital companies that are based in the United States, whether Amazon or Apple, to the technologies that are at the heart of the renewable economy. Obviously, solar panels, batteries, these are all new types of technologies. And on a conceptual level, can a country be truly sovereign without owning the technology it relies on? I feel like this wasn't an issue we necessarily previously thought much about. There was an assumption seemingly in Europe that regulatory power was enough to maintain one's independence. But is that a mistake? Is dependence on imported technology necessarily a, a strategic vulnerability? Actually, I think this is a much more important ground on which to make the case of Europe's decline relative to the US. So let's take GDP and the standard of living in any case off the table. If we put military power, technology, and then one other element that's so far missing from this conversation, which is corporate power, because you know who is it that generates these technologies and sells them and manufactures? 
Often it's government-backed labs, but ultimately they, they, they are privatized, they're commercialized. And it's really the combination of military power on the one hand, technology and corporate power, as represented by the valuation of big American capitalist businesses, that really makes up the zone where, you, you, you know, there, there, is a, there is kind of justified reasons for a European inferiority complex and where one does have to ask oneself, you know, whether or not sovereignty can really be asserted against these kind of players. Because if you look at any ranking of the global corporate hierarchy, top 50, top 500, top 100, top 20 tech firms, American dominate, China is number two, and the, and the Europeans, who 20 or 30 years ago would have been amply and strongly represented up there by the big names, if you like, of 20th century industry, the Fiat's, the, the Mercedes Benz's, the BMW's, the Siemens's, the Tissons, you know, those kind of players of the 19th and 20th century industrial revolution, all of them have dropped down the hierarchy. And you're now left with a position where Europe basically has very few significant global players, none in the platform area, two in tech, which would be ASML, the, the Dutch lithography firm, and SAP, the German software house. But then beyond that, there's really nothing there. And, and 20 years ago, you know, um, Philips in the Netherlands, which is what ASML spawned out of, and Siemens, which still has a spun out chip business, but they are second tier players compared to the Taiwanese, the Koreans, the Japanese and the Americans. America, Europe has really, really lost ground very dramatically here. But it's worth saying again, it's selective, right? So if you took banking, if you took big tech, if you took the military industrial complex, you'd say, you know, game set and match to the Americans. If you look at areas where the European state has been, despite its humming and hawing about industrial policy, actually quite proactive in supporting businesses, the story is much more mixed. So Classically, aerospace, right? If you think about commercial airliners, there's two companies in the world and Airbus, the European one, is currently really winning over Boeing quite heavily, despite Boeing's backing from the American military industrial complex. That's the result of European industrial policy. Pharmaceuticals, the same way, right? If you think about the vaccine race during COVID, Pfizer makes one of the vaccines, but it's largely based on technology that came from Europe. And the AstraZeneca vaccine, a European production was cheap and effective and worked quite well as well. If you think about 5G, right, for all of the American campaigning against Huawei and the Chinese, they end up relying on two European firms, Ericsson and Nokia, to actually supply the kit. So it's a kind of, it's a balance, but you can see where this story comes from. And in a sense, the question is, how does this play out going forward? And is there any way for Europe to make up lost ground? And this is where then I think the energy transition does become quite critical because in areas like offshore wind, for instance, America basically has zero firms that can do it, none of the equipment to do offshore wind farms, no experience with substantial offshore wind, whereas Europe, this is already a major going concern and the game is going to be played out between the Europeans and the Chinese. The question is going forward, are the Europeans going to be willing to take the gloves off? and play an industrial policy game like the Chinese and the Americans increasingly are, what's the price for doing that? And the reason why the Europeans shrink from doing this is that on, you know, prima facie, on starting from first principles, this is a bad way to conduct economic policy. It's not particularly good for taxpayers or consumers to conduct economic policy this way. That at least is what the common sense of the 1980s and 1990s taught us. And in a sense, you could say the Europeans just drank the neoliberal Kool-Aid took it more seriously than the Americans, let alone the Chinese, and in a sense have to sort of unlearn some of those lessons and risk these games, um, as complicated as they are. And to some extent, I have a great deal of sympathy for the reluctance of Europe to engage in this. The question is really historically whether it's viable going forward from here. So finally, I wanted to ask about the role that Europe's debt rules play in its economic development, or lack thereof, I suppose. How much more debt could Europe be taking on right now? I mean, presumably not as much as the United States, right? Oh, I mean, so this is really a, a sort of counterintuitive one for me because Europe's debt rules are terrible. <laughs> they're, they're absolutely terrible. They crushed Europe's development after 2010. If you're asking why G European GDP growth was slow compared to that of the US from 2010 onwards, a big part of the story is austerity in Europe. Of course, however, there was also austerity in the US. And as we know, the United States has debt rules too. And when you actually look at the net result, in other words, public investment, it's true that the United States is slightly ahead of Europe, but only by a very small margin. 
And in fact, the highest public investors in the OECD Rich Country Club in the Western world are East European EU members who benefit from relatively generous transfers for regional and structural adjustment policy, the Hungarys, the Polands, the Baltic states, all of which have public investment rates, which are, shall we say, roughly twice those of the rich Western Europeans and the United States. So the debt rules are a bad idea. They restrict investment everywhere, but do they show up in a huge difference between Europe and the United States on this metric? They don't. And in fact, stories about capital markets don't either in the aggregate. So everyone, you know, there's a common argument that says that capital markets are much deeper in the US, which is true. If you look at investment as a share of GDP, there's again very little difference between the Europeans and the Americans. And in fact, if anything, the Europeans are slightly ahead according to OECD statistics. Does that mean that you get the same venture capital support for startups and so on in Europe as you do for the US? Clearly not. But if you're looking at the aggregate picture, there really isn't as big a difference as you would expect. Would I advocate publicly, you know, borrowing more money to expand European public investment? I, I, absolutely, I would. And so does the vast, so do the vast majority of progressives in Europe. Um, these debt rules are a real problem. Could Europe borrow more? Could it borrow as much as the United States in proportional terms? Absolutely. There's really no reason to doubt it. In fact, right now, France and Germany borrows a, a substantially lower interest rate than the United States. So America's government debt is the safe asset of the world, not because it's genuinely the safest. It's the safest because it's the huge pool of it. It's a very liquid market. And so you buy it because you can sell it. Bunds, if the Germans chose to multiply their debt, they could probably increase their debt almost, they could almost probably double it without substantially, without finding themselves paying a substantial um, interest rate penalty to the United States. They would pay more than they currently do, but they currently pay less in interest than the Americans do. Even the French periodically right now pay less to borrow than the Americans do. So the, there, is, there is a debt raising capacity in Europe that isn't really an obstacle. It really is a political choice not to do it. Um, if you aggregate all of the debts in Europe, you end up with a debt to GDP ratio, which is basically comparable to that of the United States. But it's distributed amongst, you know, nation states very unequally. And of course, the problem is it isn't treated as a single debt of a single entity. And so it's very burdensome for some of the weakest economies. And Germany, on the other hand, is essentially debt unconstrained. And the astonishing thing about it is it doesn't take advantage of this situation to borrow very heavily and make good the very obvious deficits in its public infrastructure mm. at this point. Yeah, anyone who's tried riding German trains has sees the lack of investment these days, a lot of a lot of late trains. Uh, it's tough getting around. But in any case, we do need to stop here. But thanks for all this material. Next time I talk to a gloomy European, which is pretty often, I will give them some of these facts to cheer them up. We'll stop here and come right back to talk about drones. Okay, welcome back. Our next data point is $43.28 billion. That is the estimated size of the market in drones in 2022. That breaks down between military and commercial drones. The military market was about $13.42 billion. The commercial drone market was about $29.86 billion. So, the commercial side is a little bigger, but yeah, one of the unique things about drones, obviously, is that it straddles that commercial military divide, and we thought we'd get into both sides of this market. Adam, we've talked before about the deep linkages between the military and the wider economy. In the instance of drones, are drones now on the verge of yeah, making this leap from international weapon to kind of basic domestic technology? And was this conceivable without the military involvement at the outset? This is such a, a fascinating question and took me back into the military history of the 20th century. And um, the first experiments were actually done during World War I. And in its aftermath, there was an aerial torpedo, which is kind of a cruise missile, which is one version of the drone, right? Because drones can be for transport, they can be for surveillance, they can be for strikes, for attacks. And by the end of World War II, um, the British and the Americans were both equipping 
fully fledged aircraft with radio control. So they were flying big, big, big bombers by remote control, uh, largely for experimental reasons or for sort of overflying atomic test sites, for instance. And I think their first really large scale deployment was in Vietnam, where reconnaissance with drones were used on a large scale. But this is reconnaissance drones in the old sense. In other words, they are drones which um, take photographs, crash land somewhere with their parachutes and are then recovered and f- brought home. So they're like aerial photography. It's not real time monitoring of the battlefield in the way that we know it today, let alone strikes. I think the first real-time monitoring is probably done on a large and impressive scale by the Israelis in the early 1980s. And then the first, you know, truly dramatic intervention of drones on the military landscape was in the Balkans in the mid-1990s, the General Atomics Predator drones, then then in Iraq and, and Afghanistan, where they were used. Um, the FAA... The American Aviation Authority began licensing drones for use in civilian purposes, in part around Hurricane Katrina, where they were used for disaster relief and trying to spot survivors from the air. Predator drones have very potent thermal cameras, which is why they're such a lethal weapon of assassination. And it's really in the 90s and early 2000s that we begin to see the emergence of the recreational and therefore also the large scale commercial civilian market for drones. So it's a a long story that starts on the military side where you get the elaboration of the different uses of drones above all surveillance and then potentially for actually striking targets. And then the private market with the availability of increasingly cheap but sophisticated and miniaturised components like stabilisation control and cameras really coming in from the early 2000s and 2010s. And that's, that's how these things have converged. At this point, I think we should say it's a done deal. It's a present technology. It already is impacting large parts of the world in quite significant ways. There are a bunch of operations worldwide, which is quite hard to imagine doing without drones. Yeah, I wanted to get into the wider domestic uses of drones and the variety those uses can take. Amazon notably has a program that's planning to use drones for deliveries across the United States. But how could drones be deployed in other sectors? I I guess I'm just imagining agriculture. I don't know whether they could be used to water and tend to crops or public administration even. Could they be used for tax assessments on land or policing? What are the variety of domestic uses here? Yeah, the the Amazon drone delivery story meme idea is is one Jeff Bezos and the firm have been pursuing since 2013. So we're now 10 years into this fantasy. It was originally promised to be four or five years away. They do now promise that they're going to begin delivery in two locations in the US uh, this year in 2023. So we may see it come true. They expect to be delivering 500 million packages annually by drone uh, by 2030. So the dream is now of some vintage. It's not yet dead. I think I think we have to say the jury is out. In Australia, another location for obvious reasons, perhaps because of the distances where drone delivery has been quite widely discussed, that there have in fact been um, the beginnings of delivery services. So Wing, one of their operators, had one day where they made a thousand package deliveries in a single day. The federal government there is actually offering funding to another firm to do long range transportation and medical samples from difficult to reach locations in the outback to pathology labs. So there are already, you know, real moves there. But I, I think in a sense, the delivery transport story may be a bit of a red herring. It may be misleading us to where the future of the drone actually is or where the present of the drone actually is, because the FAA, according to data from 2021, then registered 1.58 million recreational drones in the United States and 622,000 commercial drones already in use. And what that's telling you is that drones are already being used on a considerable scale by corporations for a variety of uses. Well, what are those likely to be? They are, broadly speaking, I think, not in the delivery space, but in the surveillance, oversight, modelling, inspection Data gathering, in other words, is the central role that they're playing so far. And and there is huge demand for that. That's where this estimate of the scale of the market is really coming from. And it does range from architecture, engineering, engineering, 
you know, finding, getting, getting data on the state of dilapidated infrastructure and indeed agriculture, where you have to survey huge fields. And it's hugely inefficient to send somebody around or to fly an aircraft and vastly more efficient to fly a small drone over and gather the data that way. And I think that in many ways is where, where we might be headed. Police operations are already massively reinforced by drones and, and France, uh, with the series of mass protest movements that have confronted the Macron administration in recent years, has become a major test site for the civil liberties issues involved. The French police have been making very extensive use of drones to monitor crowds. That has caused uh, considerable pushback from the uh, civil liberties and freedom of information um, uh, groups in, in France. France may also, however, with the upcoming Olympics in 2024, be the first place where we actually see operational aerial taxis, another one of the science fiction uses for uh, um, drones. There is a company in France which has been running prototypes out of one of the smaller airports around Paris in the last 12 months or so, with a view to getting them authorised for first use at the Paris Olympics in 2024. So you've mentioned the FAA a couple of times. I'm curious, are there ways FAA regulations are currently holding back the domestic drone economy? Well, that's what the drone lobby thinks. Mm. On the other hand, you know, they're sensible enough to know that, you know, a bunch of people having their heads knocked off by large flying objects going 100 miles an hour would also be bad for their industry. And so what they're trying to figure out is a compromise between the industry and regulators that means that the rollout, which they see as taking place on a huge scale, can go ahead without without you know public disaster. Um, the FAA currently regulates drones quite strictly. So you can't fly them above 400 feet. You can't fly them at more than 100 miles an hour. These are drones weighing less than 55 pounds. But imagine a 55 pound object going at 100 miles an hour. I mean, this is a formidable weapon, really, of of a kinetic kind. And you have to keep a line of sight on them at all times. And that's the thing which many of the operators object to most, because that basically restricts them to very short ranges, because you can't keep a line, a direct line of sight on an object, which is You know, an Amazon delivery service won't work on that basis. America is not currently at the absolute forefront of liberalization. Many European states have forged ahead to offer more uh, liberal, but also more clear uh, regulatory pathways. The UK is particularly prominent in this, in this respects. But this is a multi-dimensional regulatory problem. In the US, it isn't just the FAA that has taken quite a firm view. There are 44 states that have enacted laws on drone usage for recreational, commercial and public use, with issues ranging from, on the one hand, civil liberties issues to privacy infringement, property rights, interference with airports, and also the question, of course, of who makes the drones and what kind of information they might be gathering from the goat drones they've produced. So who are the big drone producers these days? And does the military origins of drones still play a role here? Are there proprietary military technologies that will give U.S. manufacturers an edge in the wider drone market? Or is the technology not fundamentally complicated and just pretty widely dispersed at this point? Depends what you want to do with it. I mean, if you if you want, you know, a Reaper or Predator style drone, of what is essentially a highly sophisticated small airplane, then you probably want to go to General Atomics or some other boutique supplier like that. They are $16 million a pop. And yes, that gets you some pretty trick technology. They are extraordinary vehicles that can stay aloft for you know hours and hours and hours and end and deliver very sophisticated weapon systems. Those are the ones which you know America fought the global war on terror with for a long time. If, on the other hand, all you want to do is launch a mass attack on you know uh, a big city, Iran is your supplier of choice right now. You go with the Shah had drones. Um, they're essentially cruise missiles, a little bit like you know V1 missiles in World War II, except they have a two-stroke motor with a propeller rather than a rocket system. So they're more controllable, adaptable, and much cheaper. They come in at about twenty thousand dollars a pop, and they are proliferating like mad, as we know. That kind of technology can be improvised by relatively, um, a, you know, a very wide range of producers. Even Iran, under sanctions, has the capacity to produce a system like this. But out there in the real world, for the vast majority of uses, and also increasingly on the battlefield, the sort of expendable, affordable drones start at, you know, anyone can, you know, you can buy one in Walmart for around a hundred dollars. 
And in that market, the Chinese absolutely dominate. So we are talking about a very relatively familiar story here of, you know, boutique, super sophisticated military drones on one hand being a kind of monopoly of America and its closest allies, a range of makeshift emerging market solutions in the middle tier, and then a mass market globally dominated to the West's embarrassment by highly sophisticated Chinese manufacturers who aren't producing you know, um, DARPA, weapons grade, exclusive technologies of that type. It's just that no one else in the world is in a position to mass manufacture drones of such high quality at that kind of cost. And that gives you a de facto grip on the world market that's quite hard to break. Finally, I wanted to ask whether drones have introduced some fundamental new efficiencies into militaries. Have they disrupted war making, I guess, to use that economic buzzword disruption in some ways? Have they made sheer manpower and military logistics less important in some fundamental way? I mean, I, trying to predict the impact of technology on warfare as such is really a kind of a, a, it's a fool's game. Like it's very difficult to do. Each war is different. They all generate their waves of enthusiasm. What we can say emphatically is that the war in Ukraine, the Russian assault on Ukraine and their successful resistance against it has been a breakthrough moment for drone technologies. In that war, in this war, the one that's being waged you know, as we speak, drones are playing an absolutely gigantic, staggeringly large role. And they are omnipresent. Any given section of the battlefield at any given moment will have 20 to 30 drones on each side uh, surveilling it. A study by the by Rusi, the Royal United Services Institute in London, estimated that Ukraine is losing 10,000 drones a month on the battlefield. That's more than 300 a day. So essentially, they are fighting a drone war, which at one level has very surveil- sophisticated surveillance drones. There are the Russian cruise missiles, some of them hypersonic. Then there are the Russian Iranian derived or Iranian supplied cruise missiles coming in. And then the the troops on the ground are essentially flying up almost like recreational hobbyist type drones to surveil the opponents on the other side. And on every segment of the front line now, there are countermeasures in place, the purpose of which is essentially to block the electronic signals that allow the drones to be controlled by our opponents. So it is a completely drone-dominated battlefield. Or dominated, that's too wrong. But drones saturate the battlefield. They're in every single space. They are a terrifying, loitering psychological pressure on the troops. It's created, I think, in the same way as tactical air power did when it was introduced in a large scale at the end of World War One and then massively in World War Two. It creates a sort of omnipresent psychological threat that's not to be underestimated. And I think there is a reason to come back to your big picture question of is this going to change the, you know, the future of war? What I think is absolutely certain is that none of the non-combatant militaries that prior to this war had really taken a measure of how large this is. So as a factor, so the Ukrainians are using and losing 10,000 drones a month. The French army, which is one of the more capable European armies, has a stock currently of only 3,000. So enough to cover active operations in an intense battlefield like this for like, you know, eight or nine days, not enough even to really see them through two weeks of fighting. So there is clearly a disconnect here between what modern warfare is de facto demanding and what many of the bigger militaries, notably those in Europe, are equipped to actually provide their troops with. And that's something to look out for going forward, because if they need to build stocks to fight war at this kind of level, they need huge numbers of drones. Hmm. Yeah, no, it strikes me given your description of its contribution to the war, that we yeah we haven't yet had a kind of literary treatment of this style of warfare and may not sort of sink in until we really sort of consider this omnipresent threat, what that must feel like for folks on the front line or elsewhere in Ukraine. I mean, the other the dimension of this war is, is increasingly also the possibility of drone-on-drone combat. So, you know, in these battlefields crowded with these devices, we also have to reckon with you know, a future in which the battle is between them, as it was between aircraft, right? So aircraft move from being ground attack to being aircraft on aircraft fighting for air superiority in the space above the battlefield. And um, 
that too, I think, is a scenario that we have to contend with. Yes, it does indeed expand the battlefield and the concept of war that we have. Hmm. Well, we do need to end our conversation here for now, but yeah, certainly food for thought as the war in Ukraine continues to rage on. Ones and Twos is written and edited by me, Cameron Abadi, along with Adam Twos. It is produced by Laura Rossbrow Tellum and Rob Sachs. Our social media manager is Claudia Tady. The executive editor of FP Podcasts is Dan Efron. This show is made possible through the support of foreign policy readers. If you're interested not just in Adam Twos, but news and analysis from around the world, consider subscribing. Ones and Twos listeners even get a 15% discount. Just go to foreignpolicy.com slash subscribe and use the promo code TWOS at checkout. That is T-O-O-Z-E. And listeners, as always, we love hearing your feedback. You can send us voice messages on the Ones and Twos homepage on foreignpolicy.com, or you can email us, podcasts at foreignpolicy.com, or tweet us. That's at Ones and Twos Pod. Thanks very much for listening, and we will see you back in your feed next week. <laughs>